The Bible says, did y'all catch that? That the person that sat on the throne in heaven looked like a Jasper and a sardine stone. Do you think that means he was round and had funny shape? Or do you think they're talking about his complexion? That's a Jasper stone that you see right there. And that's a sardine stone. Somebody been lying. Somebody been lying. Because that's what the Bible says that the person sitting on the throne looks like. Who's that person sitting on the throne in heaven? Is it the king? Is it the Lord? Trust me with your, with your forgiveness. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing that God cannot do. There's no mountain that God cannot climb. God is Yahweh. You are Yahweh. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my hiding place. Yahweh. Yahweh is my hiding place. Deuteronomy 4.35. Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, he is God. There is none else beside him. Who is God? What is God? Where is God? Why is there a God? When is he coming back? There are over 4,000 recognized religions in the world, believe it or not, today. Are there 4,000 gods? In today's society, we will, we must, we got to respect everybody's belief. I have a question that I need an answer for today. Why would God create 4,000 different sets of rules and 4,000 pathways to get to him? Is it even possible in a lifetime to experience even half of these religions? There's 4,000 of them. I want to present to you today that you don't need to accept, join, or even follow, or even consider any religion. But you do need you must find out before you leave this earth, before you place back in the dirt, you need to know who God is. Or should I say, what God is? Does it even matter? This message ain't for atheists. If you think the world was created by itself, or if you think order was created from chaos, if you think calamity from an explosion created a beautiful garden and waterfalls, if you want to think that you came from a monkey, then today's message ain't for you. Please come back next Friday at 7 p.m. We would love to have you. Today's message is for those with a burning desire to worship their creator. Today's message is for those who know God is real, but they want some scriptural understanding of who he is, or should I say what he is. Today is a day that you're going to need to take some notes. If you have questions, you can put those questions in here right away. God, the, the concept, the idea of an almighty God is very difficult to come to explain is going to take time to understand this is a faith thing but i'm here to help you and i'm going to go through scripture after scripture precept upon precept line upon line and prove to you that jesus created god a more re relevant question that opposes who is god is what is god that's what we need to think about and that's what we need to find out what is god the real question is what is god god is a concept not an entity. If God is God, then he's God of what? This is why I said you need to take notes. He's God of what? If he's God of heaven and earth, if you're God of heaven and earth, what were you before the creation of heaven and earth? Then you're a king with no kingdom. You're a husband with no wife. How can you be a mother with no child? Here in John 1, 14, John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When did this happen? It is here that we clearly see God proving that he was made flesh. We know the word is Jesus. And it says he was made flesh and we saw him. Saw who? God. We saw God. Dear God, if you are God, says who? If you're a God before heaven and angels exist, then there's no one to verify that and no testimony to prove it. If you're a God, you could prove it. We know the Bible says if you testify of yourself, you're a liar. You, you're a fast runner? Says who? Who did you race? I'm the smartest person in the world. Prove it. 
You met everybody in the world? I can do 1,000 sit-ups perfectly. Says who? Listen to this life lesson. Proverbs 27, verse 2, it says, Let another man praise thee. Let somebody else praise you and not thine own mouth. A stranger. Let a stranger praise you and not your own lips. So how can God be God until and unless there's someone else or something else to praise him? God has all power. To do what? You are following me? God has all power compared to what power? But if he creates an opposing power, if he creates an imposing power and calls it evil, he can then lord over that power and now and only now can he be the almighty. Jesus has all power. The Bible declares he has all power in heaven and earth because he is God. But he's not the God of creation until he creates. I'm not the author of a book until I write the book. If I never written any book, then I'm simply not an author. It's just that simple. Hebrews 11.3 says, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. That's a person. So that the things that are seen, which are made of the things which do appear, nothing that you see was made of itself. It came from the word of God, which is Jesus. Jesus made the world. Jesus made the heavens. Jesus made everything that was made, including the concept that we now call God. To say that God has an origin, to say that God has a beginning is to imply that he needs one. God doesn't need to have an origin. He doesn't need to have a beginning. He doesn't need to have a start date. A true and living eternal God doesn't need to diminish his sovereignty by responding to a request of his identity or his nature or his pre-existence. He doesn't have to do that. If he's true and he's in the, uh, the, the mighty, almighty God, he doesn't have to respond to that. An almighty God would have to diminish his power and yield to a higher power to be created in order to have a start date. How can the clay make the potter? In order to understand how God can always exist, you would then have to put a date on exist. You can't put a date on exist. So you can't put God into a category that he won't fit in. He's too big for a start date. I want you to follow this scripture slowly. In the beginning, what beginning? The beginning of what? The very beginning? Okay. In the beginning was God. No. Follow closely. It says in the beginning was the word. Why didn't it say in the beginning was God? In the beginning was the word. This should be the end of the conversation on the deity of Jesus. Because it just told you who's in the beginning. There wasn't multiple people in the beginning. It was only Jesus. And the word was with God. And the word, Jesus, was God. Your scriptures in your Bible says the word Jesus is the word. The scripture says Jesus was God. Jesus was God in the beginning. Whatever scripture you have, it cannot contradict with this one. The scriptures don't compete with each other. They enhance each other. They all flow cohesively together. That's how the Bible is set up. That's how God set his word up. Everything works together. If you, if you have a scripture that trumps another scripture, then you need to remove your doctrine, remove yourself, remove your own thoughts because scriptures work together. The Bible says in Isaiah 43 verse 12, I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you, therefore you are my witnesses of the Lord, that I am God. Who is Isaiah talking about here? Here in chapter 43, who is God here? Who is this person that's declaring I am God? There's an erroneous teaching that proves a misunderstanding that says there's God, the Father. Have you heard this? There's God, the Father, and then there's God, the Son. That's incorrect. It's wrong. It lacks biblical scholarship. If you read Isaiah 44, 6, the very next chapter, it says, Thus said the Lord, the King of Israel. Who's the King of Israel? Who's the King of Israel? Okay. Pilate wrote a title and he put it on a cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Okay. That's, so that's who the King of Israel is. Let's go back to Isaiah. And his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me, there is one other God. 
It says there is no, none other God. So this one person, Isaiah, God is saying he's the first and the last. Well, why is Jesus saying the same thing in Revelation? He says the same thing in Revelation 22, verse 13. He says, I am Alpha and Omega. Do you know what Alpha and Omega means? In the Greek alphabet, it begins with Alpha and ends with Omega. Just like English begins with A and ends with Z. You can't have any English word without using these 26 letters between A and Z. That's the same thing God is saying when he's using the Greek alphabet, because this was translated into Greek. It says uh, he's the beginning and the end by saying he's the Alpha and the Omega. Got that? Not only is Jesus saying, I am the beginning and the end, he's using the alphabet to remind you he is the word. Did you catch that revelation? He's using words to prove he is the word. He's using the alphabet to remind you he is the word, and you can't have a word without the alphabet. I am the alpha. I am the omega. Okay? I am the beginning. I am the end. That's literally what he's saying. Since God says he's the first and the last, we just read that in the last slide, we have a problem because Jesus is saying the same exact thing, and you have to deal with that. That's written in your Bible. The very next chapter says in Isaiah 45, 23, I have sworn by myself. You know why God swears by himself? Because there is no one else. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, he says, and it shall not return. That unto me, that means it's going to happen. This is God saying this in Isaiah, in the Old Testament, so-called Old Testament, that unto me every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall swear. God said, that's going to happen. It's not coming back to me void. In Romans 14, it says, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Wait. Why does Christ have a God-level job? Why is on Jesus' resume, what, what's on Jesus' resume that will qualify him to be the ultimate and final judge of all creation unless it's his creation? Verse 11 says, for it is written, as I, as I live, said the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So I thought we just read that God said that you're going to every knee and every, and every tongue is going to bow to him. Now Jesus is saying the same thing. So are we going to be bowing to Jesus and confessing to God? I, I don't I don't understand how this is difficult. We already read that we will bow and confess to God. So why is there a judgment seat for Jesus? Why does he own or possess a judgment seat? Verse 12 says, so that every one of us shall give an account of himself to God who will be sitting in the judgment seat. And we just read that was Christ. So let me get this straight. In Isaiah, it is clear that every knee must bow and every tongue confess or swear, same word. In Romans, every knee must bow and every tongue confess to God. And in Philippians, it clearly says every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under earth. This makes zero sense unless Jesus is God. On judgment day, I don't care what your religion is. I don't care what your denomination is. You will bow. You will be bound to Jesus at whose judgment seat? Jesus. Je at Jesus' judgment seat. And you will confess, oh, you're God. Okay. But what difference does it make? Why do I care? There's a God. So what? What's in it for me? How does knowing there's a God affect my life? Which life? Why are you blindly concerned about this life? What about the next one? What about the next life that you must live? That's the permanent one. Your next life is the permanent life. Can you create something to dwell in while you're in it? Do you build your house from the inside? Did y'all set up the tent the other day while you're in it? Listen to this prophecy. God said in Leviticus 26, and I will set my tabernacle among you and my soul should not abhor you. When did he do that? And I will walk among you and will be your God and ye shall be my people. When did God set up a tabernacle, a tent or a dwelling place and walk among us? When did God walk among us? In the first chapter of John, you'll find the most detailed description of Jesus. When you get to verse 10 though, you got a problem. If you still believe there's a separate person from God, it's okay. Watch this. He says, he was in the world. Who's the he? Jesus. And the world was made by him. You got a problem. If you already have the revelation of Jesus deity, you'd be praising God right now. You can praise God right here because this makes sense. Jesus was in the world. He created 
easy. If not, you have to do some serious mental gymnastics to make sense out of this. He was in the world that he created. That's what the Bible says. I need you to show me using scripture when God who made the world was in the world and the world didn't know it. When did that happen? Is this where he set up the tabernacle among us and walked among us? Or was that coming? I'll read it again. And I will set my tabernacle among you and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk, walk. God has feet. I will walk among you and, you and will be your guide and you shall be my people. Here's a perfect example of a tabernacle. In Revelation 21 and 3, it says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So is this an invisible spirit floating around, or is this Jesus coming back? Who is Jesus coming back for? When we see the word son, when we see the word S-O-N, when we see the word father, our minds automatically do what it's designed to do. Find a correlation or image or point of reference. It's natural to think of your father when you hear the word father. That's what happens. That's what your brain does. But when we're talking about God, we're talking about God level stuff. Jesus is the second man, Adam. Okay. So Jesus had to be called God's son, right? Adam was God's son. Did Adam have a natural father? Did Adam have a father as a result of copulation? Did Adam have a belly button? Did the stork bring him? 1 Corinthians 15, 45, it says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last man, Adam, was a quickening spirit. Who's the last Adam? Jesus. Who is the only person that can undo Adam's stupid mistake? That caused the devil to have dominion over all of his creation. God. You can't trust nobody to do this. Who would be willing to be murdered for sinners? Who wants to die for a bunch of sinners that, that probably keep on sinning? Only God has that kind of love. He had to come. He had to do it himself. The only way he can undo Adam is to become the last Adam. Since the first Adam messed it up. Adam was made of flesh, okay? And God had to be of Adam's flesh. He had to come through Adam's flesh. That's why the curse says the seed of a woman shall bruise the devil's head. Who's the first Adam to God? His son. So if Jesus is the replacement Adam, Jesus has to have a God. Adam had to have a father. Jesus on earth has to have a father. If the scriptures say God is the God of all flesh, when God comes to earth in flesh, that flesh has to be subject to God. Because the Bible says God is the God of all flesh. Once he puts on flesh, he can't just take his word and move it out of the way. We just read that it's forever established. It will never come back to him. He said that he has to abide by his own word. So when he puts on flesh, he has to be subject to himself, God, because God is the God of all flesh. That's why he still has to pray, because flesh has to pray. That's why he had to get baptized, because your flesh has to get baptized. And that's why he still had to keep the commandments, even though he's God. That's why Jesus said in John 10, 30, I and my father are not two separate people. We are one entity. In verse 31, they tried to stone him. Why did they try to stone him? Back then, there were laws that allowed you for stoning a person. In verse 32, Jesus asked him, what do you charge? What do you, what, what's the charge? What do you, what are you storming for? They told him, blasphemy. When did Jesus blaspheme? They said, you are a man and you're making yourself God. When did he say that? Saying you and the father are one is saying you are God. That's why they tried to stone him. That's why they charged him with blasphemy. So when Jesus said, I and my father are one, he's saying, I am God. That's what they thought. That's what they perceived. That's what they knew. That's what the word taught them. They knew that him saying that, he's saying he is God. Why do people limit an almighty God and say, you can create a man, but you can't become one? Why do people say God can only be one thing at a time? Is it because of our minds can only handle one thing at a time? Look at this right here. Perfect example, we have a real visual, a real example of what God is. He's the living water, right? Okay. 
We have all three elements at once making H2O. What is water? What is H2O? Hydrogen, oxygen, and atom. Okay? What is ice? It's hydrogen, oxygen, and atom. What is steam? Hydrogen, oxygen, and atom. It's the same thing. You can do this at home. You can do this experiment yourself. Water all in the same place at the same time. Water, ice, steam, one cup. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, one body. God, Jesus, Comforter, one person. Just like you are a soul, you have flesh and you have a mind. But you're one person. Where is this entity? Where is the supreme being we call God? He's in heaven? Okay, yeah, but where in heaven? He's on the throne? He's on the throne, right? Okay. That's why Jesus said in Revelation 3, 21, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, so Jesus has a throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. Why does Jesus say he's sitting in the throne with his father? Big old 33-year-old man, too old to be sitting in his father's lap, right? Unless he is the father. The word father simply means power or authority. The, the father in your house should be, he should be the authority of that house. The father of your house should be the last say so in that house. He should be the authority. That's what he's saying when he say father. He's not talking about another person. Okay. He's, he is the authority. He is the father. So we see Jesus being worshiped in heaven, even though he's on earth. My God is awesome. Woo, all right, forgive me for sounding rudimentary, but watch this. Revelation 7, 11. It says, and God was, God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb. Is God sitting in the throne and lamb somewhere else? Go to verse 17. It clearly says, for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne. Who is sitting on the throne? Go back to verse 10. It clearly says God on the left side. You see that? I highlighted it, God, okay? Seven verses later, he got up and he ran and Jesus hurried up and sat in his place, right? This only makes sense if Jesus is sitting in God's lap. <laughs> and you'll still have a problem with that theory if you say God is just a spirit because he would need legs to sit and legs to have his son sitting in his lap. You see how ridiculous it gets? It's God, that's it. Makes sense. One dude. You see one person there? That's God. You see that one person there? That's the Lamb. You see that one person there? That's Jesus. You see that one person there? That's the Holy Ghost. We don't have God sitting in the lap and a Lamb sitting in his lap. We don't know. The only doctrine that makes sense with all these scriptures is Jesus is God. That's it. You remember when Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, he had a feast and, and he was praising his idols and, and God showed up and he wrote on the wall, Mene Tekel Upfran, Upfras, or whatever. Why does the Bible say that was written by a man's hand? Can you imagine if the Lord just, just reached into the visible and started digging out the drywall with his finger? Can you imagine that? The king saw this hand writing on the wall. He was scared. The Bible says he was so scared that the joints of his hips gave out and his knees knocked together. That's what will happen if you see a hand just start writing. Whose hand was it? Whose hand can just come into a room, just a hand by itself. I thought God was a spirit. Why was he so afraid? This wasn't a dream. The Bible says it was a hand. Every person that has a hand has a body. The Bible says it was a man's hand, not a vision, not a dream. The Bible says it was a man's hand. Am I trying to say God has a body? Remember when the three Hebrew boys was thrown in the fiery furnace? Okay. One of them was Daniel. The king said, we threw in three somebodies. How come I see a fourth person? Wait a minute. The fourth one looks like the son of God. Mary wasn't even born yet. How is there a son of God? How is that even possible for there to be a son of God if he's the son of Mary, who Mary wasn't even born yet? And how does the king know what the son of God looked like? With our carnal minds, we confuse our own self. With our carnal minds, we wrestle with spiritual things. Because our carnal, natural mind, we try to force God into what we perceive as a father and a son. But we know we can't apply that to Jesus who had no natural father. Joseph ain't his daddy. 
our carnal minds have to be forced to accept that God, the last Adam, needs flesh. We have to force our mind to accept he needs flesh and he must be born of a woman. That's it. You just have to accept that by faith. God, with this flesh, can hide himself now. God can walk the earth for 33 years behind flesh. That's why the Bible says, verily thou art a God that hideth yourself. O oh, God of Israel. God hides himself with a veil. The same way a bride hides her face until she joined at the altar with her husband. Or if you like my wife, you'll put the uh, veil on backwards and double hide your face. Did God marry us yet? Did God marry us yet? No, he has not married us yet. Okay, that's going to happen. God uses a, a body as a veil, just like a, a woman does, okay? Which is his flesh. That flesh is the son of Adam. And Adam is the son of God. And this ain't no ordinary flesh that God has, that Jesus has. This is the kind of flesh that can walk through walls, remember? And he ate some food. And he told Thomas, stick your hand in here. Look at that. He, he walked through the wall. He just appeared out of nowhere, but he can still eat. And he got a hole in his hide. This ain't no ordinary dude. That's God. What a mighty God we serve. When you see the word son of God in scripture, you can simply say flesh of God. It's the same thing. Let me prove it. Hebrews 10 verse 20 says, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, that is to say, his flesh got it when you see flesh it's, it's, a, it's the same thing as veil same thing god is hiding himself he's hiding his glory he's hiding his power behind this body behind this flesh when you see the word flesh destri describing jesus in scriptures you're saying god's veil god's flesh is jesus that god's veil is jesus what veil god created a veil to hide himself that veil or his flesh same thing is here to undo adam's mistake God becomes Adam. That's why sometimes he's called the son of God. And sometimes he's called the son of man. That body on the cross is the flesh of God. Okay? That's the flesh of God. That's the veil of God. That body on the cross is the flesh of God. That body you saw writing on the wall, that hand you saw writing on the wall, that same body that was walking in the fiery furnace, that's God. That's Jesus. Jesus said, I come in the volume of the book. It was written of me. What does that mean? The entire book was written of me. How's this 33-year-old man saying the entire scriptures were written of him? How is that possible? Jesus said, for had you believed Moses, you would have believed me because he wrote of me. When did Moses write about Jesus? When did Moses write about Jesus? Jesus said, this is the third declaration he's making. He said, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be filled, which were written in the law of Moses. That's the Torah and in the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all those guys, and in the Psalms concerning me. Look at this extremely bold statement. Jesus is saying the entirety of the scriptures were written of me. How? So where in the Torah is Jesus even mentioned? If you look for the name Jesus, you'll never find it. Jesus is just, Jesus is simply English for, uh, uh, or for Yahshua. It's the English version or the Latin or Roman pronunciation of Yahshua, which means God's salvation. God's salvation. God's way of saving. God's way of undoing Adam's stupid mistake. You're not going to find the word Yahshua in the Torah. But he said it was written of him. So that means we got to find him in there. The Torah. What's the Torah? Do you know what the Torah is? The Torah is the, book, the, mo the books that Moses wrote. Do you know what those are? You know what the books of Moses wrote? Okay, the law, the commandments, the books that Moses wrote, the Torah. Jesus said he's in here. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The first five books of the Bible is called the Torah or the law or the books that Moses wrote. Okay? I can go through each of those five books and show you Jesus in each one. But who was the person walking in the garden with Adam? We got to start with that. He was walking in the garden. Do you know what color eyes uh, our eyes turn when we drink wine? You know what color our eyes turn when we drink wine? Genesis 49 says, his eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. That's the best eyes I can find, sorry. In Exodus 33, that's Genesis, his Exodus. He said, thou canst not see my face. This is God telling Moses, you can't see my face. 
I have too much glory. So I have to hide myself when I come to earth. I have to hide this glory in a veil or flesh. The Bible says no man shall see me and live. That's why God needed a veil. Do you understand why God needed flesh? Why he needed a veil? He's too powerful. And if you see him, you'll die. But he's going to do Moses a favor. Moses, you my dude, you my homie. I'm going to do something for you. The Lord told Moses, look, there's a place by me right over here. I want you to stand on that rock. What did Moses need to stand on the rock? Feet and legs. Okay. So Moses got feet and legs because he's standing on a rock. Okay. Let's keep that same logic. God said, and it should come to pass while my glory passed by, when I walk by you, I'm going to take you and I'm going to put you in a corner of the rock and I will cover you with my hand. What do you need to cover somebody with a hand? You need a hand. What is your hand attached to? A body. He said, I'm going to cover your hand while I pass by. That's the same hand he used to write on the wall. And he says that I will take my hand. I will take away my hand. When I take it away, I'm going to wait till I pass by you. And I'm going to take my hand away and you're going to see my back. What do you need to have a back? A body. But my face shall not be seen. We God just told you out of his own mouth, he has a hand, he has a face, and he has a back. What do you, what, what do, you do with that? Because you have no problem believing that Moses had legs and feet, and it didn't say he has that. It never said that. But you use your mind and you use a, a picture and an image in your mind. If he's standing on a rock, he must have legs and feet. So if God is walking around, walking past Moses, don't he have to have legs and feet too? He got a hand in the back and he has a face. What? Why would he say no man can see my face unless they die if he doesn't have a face? All right, let's see if we can find Jesus in the Psalms. I could go through all the Torah, but I'm gonna try to save some time. Let's go to Psalms 18 verse 10. The Bible says, and he rode upon a cherub and he did fly. Yep, he did fly upon the wings of the wings of the wind. The wings of the wind is a cloud. This is Jesus ascension after he resurrected from, from, the, uh, from the tomb. What did the prophet say about Jesus? In Zechariah 14, 9, it says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Is Jesus king of kings <laughs> and lord of lords? It says, In that day shall, shall there be one Lord. Uno. Jesus being born of Mary doesn't create an additional God. God the Father or God the Son. The scriptures say in that day when Jesus is born, there will still be one Lord. There's only one Lord. There's only one faith and only one baptism. And his name is one according to the Bible. Yahweh is Yahshua. God is Jesus. The Father is the Son. There's only one Lord. That's why I'm trying to train my tongue to start calling him Yahshua. Start calling God Yahshua instead of Jesus. Because there's power in that name. There's some power in the name. Proverbs says the name of the Lord, singular, one person, not three dudes. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. There's only one name that is a strong tower. There's only one place to run to and be safe. His name is Yahweh. Yahweh. Yahshua. Hallelujah. Did you catch that? Because I don't care where you go. I don't care what language you change the name, the Lord's name into. I don't care what language you speak. God says you can change every word you want, but there's one word that you will never change. I won't allow the highest praise to not include my name. You can put a J there if you want to. You're still going to say why. You're still going to say Yah. You're still going to pronounce it Yah. The word, the word hallelujah has a J there. Why don't you say hallelujah? Why do you still use God's name there? Because that's his name. Hallelujah. You see that? That's why his name has to be Yahshua. Jesus takes the word. Jesus takes the name Yah out of that. You see what happens? That's why we greet each other saying praise the Lord. You know what praise the Lord means? It literally means hallelujah. That's the highest praise in English. When you say praise the Lord, you just gave God the highest praise. There's no word you can praise God with that's bigger than that. Here we have the prophet Isaiah. Once again, talking about a child that will be born in the future. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Listen carefully. A virgin shall be pregnant and have a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? That baby that is born and can't feed himself is God with us. Now, we know that in the uh, uh, quote unquote Old Testament is I, Emmanuel, in the Greek, in the New Testament, is Emmanuel, same person, same word. I don't want you to get confused. So when the Apostle Matthew writes about the actual baby being born, when the baby was born, 
he says of the virgin born baby, he says that baby is Emmanuel. When you interpret Emmanuel, it means God with us. Where is God? Right here, laying down in the manger. Where is God? Getting his diaper changed and answering your prayer at the same time. Where is God? Getting his nose wiped while holding the sun, the moon, and the stars in place. The foundations of the world are being held in place by this baby. The firmament that he created is unpenetrable because it was built by the hands of this baby laying in a manger crying because he wants something to eat. What a mighty God we serve. This same baby is coming back as a lion to deliver us and destroy the works of our enemy. This baby is Emmanuel. God is with us. That's why you have to get baptized in his name. That's why you have to surrender your life to him so that you can be dead to your sins and your life be hid with Christ in God. The Bible says, for you are, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. It should start to make sense now when you read Christ in God. When you read Christ in God, I, I get that. Do you get what that means, Christ in God? Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Notice they're already calling him Lord. Pay attention to that. This is Romans and they're already calling Jesus Lord. Which was made, he was made of the seed, that's flesh, of David according to the flesh. Jesus was made of David's seed just like the scripture said he would. Sorry, Joseph, you are not the father. That holy thing in Mary's womb ain't yours. That's the seed of the woman that God said would bruise Satan's head in Genesis. I could have started with this scripture said, praise the Lord, see you next Friday at 7 p.m. The scripture says, he, who's the he here? Jesus. Yeshua was in the world and the world was made by him. Who is the him? Yeshua. Yeshua and the world, and the Bible says, and the world didn't even know it. Why not? Because God was hiding behind that veil called flesh. How are you going to deal with the scripture that says Jesus created the world? How, how are you going to deal with that? What, what if you're looking at Jesus and you're and you're you're talking to Jesus and you're asking him, where's God? Why are you looking at Jesus and looking for God? As if there's two separate people. That's like you're standing in the desert and you got a block of ice and you're looking for water. You 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 you're cooking and you're watching the steam go to the pot lid and you wonder why there's water in there when you take the lid off. It's the same thing, it's the same person. What does John 12 45 mean? And he and he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. Jesus himself said, anybody that sees me, stop looking for the Father. You've already seen him. This one was for you. That, that one was for you. When I die, my family gets all my stuff. That's why I got to make sure my daughters marry the right person. Because they can marry the wrong guy. He might kill me and get rich. While I'm alive, everything is mine. That's why I have a will. So when I'm dead, nobody will fight over my stuff. Nobody going to be fighting over anything. Yeshua said, all things that the Father has are mine. Who does heaven belong to? Who does the throne belong to? Jesus said, everything belongs to Jesus. If God has angels, why is Jesus saying they're his? That would mean God owns nothing. That makes no sense unless he is God. And unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Oh my God. It is Yahshua that I praise. It is Yahshua that I worship. It is Yahshua that died for me. It is Yahshua that I gave my life to. It is Yahshua that I live for and work for and long for and hope for. It's Yahshua that's coming back for me. Well, who is that that I pray to? Who is that that answers prayers? Does Yahshua or God answer your prayers? It can get really silly when you start separating them out. The Bible says, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. That's why you have to pray Father in the name of Jesus. That's the reason you have to pray like that. That's a revelation. That's how you get your prayers answered because he told you whatever you ask the father. So you have to address the father. When you say that you're recognizing that he is the father and that he has the power. But wait, Jesus said, whatsoever you shall ask the father in my name, he will give it to you. Okay. Well, two chapters earlier in John 14, 13, he, he said, Jesus said, and whatsoever you shall ask in my, in my name, that will I do. I do so that the father may be glorified in the flesh, in this flesh you're looking at so that God will be glorified in the flesh. So that if you don't use your carnal mind, 
you'll glorify the flesh as God when you say father in the name of Jesus. Even Satan himself produces evidence that Jesus is God. Jesus told him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Why is Jesus responding to Satan? Don't tempt God. When did Satan tempt God? The proper way to read scriptures is when it says it is written, you have to go read what was written. Okay. It's written in the commandment. You shall not tempt the Lord your God, capital Lord, as you tempted him at Mount Sinai. All right, let's go to heaven. Let's go to heaven and see who's sitting on the throne. Revelation 4, 3. He that sat looked like a jasper and a sardine stone. The Bible says, did y'all catch that? That the person that sat on the throne in heaven looked like a jasper and a sardine stone. Do you think that means he was round and had funny shape? Or do you think they're talking about his complexion? That's a jasper stone that you see right there. And that's a sardine stone. Somebody been lying. Somebody been lying. Because that's what the Bible says that the person sitting on the throne looks like. Who's that person sitting on the throne in heaven? Is it the king? Is it the Lord? Well, well if it's the Lord, the Bible says Jesus is the king of kings and Lord of lords. That makes him the person on the throne anyhow you do it. If Jesus is the king of kings, it makes sense why everybody will have to bow down and confess that he is Lord. Every king has to bow down to the king. Every Lord will have to confess out of their mouth that Jesus is Lord, Lord of lords. They already called him Lord, right? We, we saw that. They already called him Lord. So why is he making a statement that even though you're calling me Lord, one day you gonna, I'm going to make you bow down and call me Lord? No, no, that means God. That means one day you're going to bow down and say Jesus is God. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6.15, in this time, he's going to show you who is the blessed and only power ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords. What a mighty God we serve. This same God that I'm talking about is Jesus, Joshua. This God ain't coming back as a lamb with an olive branch. This is a mighty warrior and he's coming back with a sword. Revelation says, they shall, they, they shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And they that are with him are called the chosen and the faithful. These 10 nations are gonna make war with him, but he will overcome them. You know why? Because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. In Hebrews, it says, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all. Who's going to judge all? Is God the supreme judge? Who will you be standing in front of on judgment day? Who is God the judge? In uh, 2 Timothy 4, 1, it says, I charge thee before, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember Jesus has a judgment seat. Do you see two people here? I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see two people? Or oh, he's letting you know God and, and Jesus Christ is the same person. When you see the scriptures right like that, it's not talking about two people. It's the same person. He says, I charge thee, thee before, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge Wait, I thought God was a judge. It's a judge Jesus shall judge. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the alive and the dead, alive and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom. The alive and the dead sound like everybody to me. So that sounds like judgment day to me, at his appearing and his kingdom. We already went over the fact that Jesus owns everything. It's his kingdom. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I thought it just said God. Who is the supreme judge? We all, every last one of us has an appointment to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. I hope you take some time to repent. I hope you get your, your record expunged. I hope you talk to Jesus and beg for the forgiveness that you need before your appointment. Before your appointment date, I hope you have gotten forgiveness from God. In Hebrews it says, and to, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel, okay? See that you refuse him, refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refuse him that speak, that spake on earth, which much more shall we, right. much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Who's speaking from heaven? Whose voice then shook the earth. But now we have promised saying yet more, once more I shall not, I shake not the earth only, but also the heaven. We started in verse 24 talking about Jesus. This is all Jesus. This, this, these set of verses are saying that Jesus is speaking from heaven and that at one time 
Jesus spoke and shook the earth. When did that happen? If you go to Exodus 19, and Mount Sinai was together, all together on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. He just told you. This is one more verse. The verse we just read before that, it literally says Jesus. In verse 26, it says, when the earth then shook. This is what he's talking about. This is the precept for that. But we know back in Mount Sinai, that was God. The only way this makes sense is unless Jesus is God. We're going to go into a part two next week. But I'm going to use it based on your question. Send me your questions and I'm going to formulate the next set of slides based on your question. I want to go into more detail of how Jesus created God. Right now, I just wanted to point out in this first one how Jesus is God. But Revelation 19 says, and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. He's coming back for war. He's not coming back for peace. These 10 nations are about to lose a war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. What color is that flame of fire? His eyes were the color of a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. That's why I don't get bent out of shape about his name. And he had on an outfit that was already dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. That's my Jesus. That's my king. That's my savior. That's my redeemer. That's my fervent lover. That's my God. Thank you all for coming. That's my end. I appreciate you all. Please, please come back on Tuesday at 7 p.m. We'll be on covenantservants.online.church. That's not www. If you type www, you won't get us. You have to go to covenantservants.online.church. Or you can go to www.covenantservants.com. Scroll down to diaspora teaching. Click that and you will catch us every Tuesday there. On Fridays, we will be here every Friday at 7 p.m. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate your time. Trust me with your, with your forgiveness. Yeah, yeah.